by way of intro, uh, biographical snapshots of our speakers tonight. We have two different speakers who will be here for this People of the End Times Conference. Um, the first one will be Dr. Joel Wilson, and uh, Dr. Joel has been integral in the ministry of a college in our area, Criswell College, you may have heard of it, in Dallas, and had uh, served at various colleges before that, but is, was at Criswell College as well, uh, helping theological students process and, and learn and uh, be equipped on campus. So uh, we're grateful that he is bringing a word to us tonight with his uh, many years of wisdom and many studies. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but he has a lot of books. <laughs> way more way more than even me. And like, so uh, he's got a lot of knowledge he can share with us and challenges for us. And so we're excited tonight to hear from uh, Dr. Joel. I appreciate him and his wife so much in their ministry here at the church. Uh, it's truly a blessing. And uh, definitely on this topic, too, he, he knows a lot. And so I want you all to definitely get excited and be willing to hear from Dr. Joel. Uh, also, we have a uh, special guest, Jared Allen, and Jared, it's a privilege to have him here with us uh, tonight. I'm going to share a little bit of just biographical info uh, from uh, his work here. Uh, he has been connected with uh, a missionary group called E3 Partners. Now, if you've been in Dallas for a while, you may have heard of E3 Partners. They do some great international missions work. And, uh, you just hear story after story about, wow, E3 is doing that. It's awesome. So it's truly a blessing to have uh, him and his wife here tonight and just to know about some of the work they've done in the past in the Middle East. Uh, he has served as a missions pastor at MacArthur Boulevard Baptist Church in Irving, Texas. And uh, they moved to the Middle East and worked among Arab Muslims. So he has some great insight for us on some of these questions about what is going on in the Middle East and, uh, and how does that relate to the gospel and the Lord's work and what's going to happen in the future. And so it's very exciting to have him with that kind of ground knowledge here, bringing a challenge to us and a word to us tonight. He was involved in training, equipping, and mobilizing indigenous local believers. And so that's an awesome ministry right there because it's not necessarily just someone coming in from the outside saying, hey, do everything our way. It's someone coming in, letting the gospel work, and training somebody, equipping them. So it's just really good to hear from him tonight and some of his wisdom. And they multiply disciple, planted churches in hard to reach areas of the Middle East. Uh, Jared and Joel have four children, Judah, Lydia, Hudson, and Ishmael. Great names. And um, uh, he's also a former Marine, a veteran who served with US forces in Iraq. Also has a BA from Criswell College and pastoral ministry and an MA in Islamic studies from a Christian perspective from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is a great school, a little bit biased, but you know, it is a good school, internationally known, great programs. And um, so we also appreciate that about his studies, the hard work he put in there and the things he's learned from great professors. And they have a passion that God's placed in their heart for reaching Muslim people to make a difference for the church's mission. So uh, that's some really good stuff. So there's a, a picture, an outline of, of who will be bringing the word of God to us and bringing some new knowledge to us tonight. So we're very grateful for that. And our format will be to hear from Dr. Joel first. And then after we have a, an intermission and some worship time, we'll go ahead and hear from our friend Jared Allen. And uh, be prepared to hear from the Lord tonight and to, to ask questions. How can we reach people in our area? And what could God be doing around um, neighbors I have? And how how's this playing to the end times? Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer, though, as we begin. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be gathered here tonight. And I pray that you bless each one with the teaching tonight and the message. And I pray you just speak to us about how we can be involved in your kingdom work and how it points us to the future, about how there are things going on that should make us alert, that your coming is even more soon uh, than we can imagine. And help us to be about many coming to know you, even from different religions, such as um, Islam, coming to know your son, Jesus Christ, and trust him, and to know about him and live for him. And um, may we also reach out to those in our area and make an impact for your kingdom. We ask for your blessing on this conference and even your protection, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Brother Joel, if you'll come on up. Well, it's wonderful to be able to start our first End Times Prophecy Conference here at our new church merge, the Lakes. And so I couldn't think of a better way to do it than to talk about our Lord Jesus Christ. And the theme of our conference is what people of the end times. 
Tonight, my assignment is to talk about the person of the end times, and that person is Jesus Christ. Without him, there will be no end, and everything would go on just as it is, but we know that no matter how dreary, dread, good, bad, sad, anything good looks, Jesus Christ is going to make it even better by his coming when he rules and reigns on the earth. If you're like me, you'd probably go shopping at Walmart. I'm, I'm there probably at least three times a week. This past week, I decided to just pay a little visit and go watch one of my favorite things. Does anybody here like ice cream? Yeah. Amen. You know, pecan praline, please. <laughs> I like it. I just wish they made cookie dough, just cookie dough, but they don't anymore. <laughs> That's it. So I went in the store, and normally if you go in there, you will notice that there are Arabs or there are Muslim people in there anytime you go. Well, I said, Lord, show me how big is our need in our area in Saxe, Murphy, to reach Muslim people. So I walked around the store, and also not an ulterior motive, I have a Fitbit. <laughs> and so I walked around the store to get in my 10,000 steps, and I counted at least 18 Muslim people in that store at one time. I thought, thank you, Lord, that's all I need to know. You have your ways of showing us. Now, how will you direct us as a church to reach Muslim people? So we'll see how he does that in the days ahead. But we want to talk about the person of the end times who will help us reach Muslim people who loves them as much as he does the Jewish people and much as he does the Gentile people. But we want to reach out to them so let's talk about what motivates us to reach people for Jesus Christ and to look at the end times. We call this the doctrine of eminence. Has anybody by any chance ever heard the word doctrine of eminence? Good, that's one of us or two of us, <laughs> three or maybe four of us. Eminence means that we as the church of Jesus Christ, not a church building, but the people of God, we are looking for the next event on God's prophetic calendar, and that is what? Does anybody know? Rapture. Rapture. Very good. So we want to ask ourselves, if that's the next event on God's prophetic calendar, is there anything that is stopping that right now? Yes. Is there anything? What, what, is, what would be stopping that? His love and desire that we reach more people. Yes, that's right. That's the only thing, and when he's, his love will never end, but what he will one day say, enough is enough. And that's when he will come, and we believe that he will rescue his church, he will rapture his church, and we will meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him, and then we will return with him once again, you know, to rule and reign with him for a literal 1,000 year period on the earth called the millennium. But how do we get there to eminence? Is eminence really taught in the scripture? That's what we want to ask ourselves. So we're going to look at it from a number of scriptures today because we believe that doctrine is important. I believe one of the reasons our churches are in such trouble today is because our pastors don't preach doctrine. They preach good, what I call seer sucker sermons. <laughs> or they preach sermons that have lots of sugar on them. They want to make everybody feel good. But the doctrine of eminence is one that has been greatly neglected. Just at a later date, we're going to be talking about another neglected doctrine in the church is the doctrine of judgment. Oh, nobody wants to hear about judgment because, you know, that, that doesn't make us feel good. We'll have to leave the church because we came from our shot of, you know, feel good this week. But, you know, judgment is going to be good because that which lasts for eternity, what will last for eternity and will be rewarded. Eminence is that doctrine that tells us that Jesus Christ could come at any second. He could come right now before I ever finish this message. There is nearly nothing to stop him from coming. He could come just right at this second. Now this week, I did a lot of planning. And first of the week, one computer crashed. Now yeah, couldn't recover anything. Then this afternoon, second computer crashed. And so I couldn't bring one of my two sound effects today for you to hear. So if you've ever heard me play the air trumpet, no, you don't hear that today. But that is one of the next sounds that you would hear if you're a believer. Thessalonians tells us that the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. You would hear his trumpet. What will that trumpet sound like? Mm, I'm not sure. 
You know, I have my ideas. It could be when the roll is called up yonder. Maybe it's a battle here in the Republic. But it, you know, it'll be a trumpet sound. It will awaken you. And we will hear something like with a shout like, Glory! Yeah, he comes. <coughs> and then you'll hear a trumpet. And all that will take place so fast that it could not be measured. If we were to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'd find out that the Apostle Paul uses a very special, special Greek word. That word, he says, it will be done in the twinkling of an eye. Do you know how fast a twinkling of an eye is? Well, the Greek word here there, now I don't want to confuse you, is the word atomos. Where do you think we get that word from? The word atom. Or they're, they're atoms. And atom was the smallest divisible unit that could be measured in Paul's thinking during the time of the writing of the New Testament. So we know today that there are even smaller measures of time, but his emphasis was that it could, cannot be measured. So the rapture or the calling of the church to be with him will, will happen what in a twinkling or immeasurable amount of time that quick. If you can blink your eyes, it's quicker than that. Snap your fingers, quicker than that. It's even faster than uh, Emmett Smith. <laughs> you know, and he would be slow beside that. But it would be that quick. And all of a sudden, you will know the meet, and you will meet the Lord in the air, but the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will rise up to meet with Him. And it says, so shall we ever be with Him. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But let's look and find out did the New Testament writers literally believe in the eminence of Christ that he would come in any moment? My answer ahead of time is yes. But let's look at it from the chronological writing of the New Testament. Let's look in the book of James very quickly, if you have your Bible there. We're going to look in chapter 5. We're going to look in verses 7 through 9. James is probably the first book written recorded in the New Testament. Uh, James does not have a full-blown developed eschatology or anything like that like the Pauline epistles do because that was a mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul. But James, writing to the diaspora or those Jews scattered abroad, he says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, for the coming of the Lord. Behold, a farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. But you also are called to be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. What draws near? Murmur not against one another. Don't judge each other, brothers, lest you be judged. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Just that easy, literal, plain, grammatical reading that tells you what? James believed what his Jesus could come at any second. Now, if James believed that, probably about 55 A.D., what's happened? 2,000 years have already gone by. Where are you at, Jesus? Why are you taking so long? It's just as Brother Allen, one of our elders said, it is a mercy, the love of God, His grace to reach. One day, it will not be exhausted, but there will be a time stamp on it, and God will say no more. That's what I want to be a motivation to our church to reach out to Muslim people in our community, to reach out to Gentile people, Jewish people, Hispanic people, Asian people, is what knowing that the Lord can come at any moment. So let me go ahead and ask you one of the questions I'm going to ask at the end of this is who has the Lord placed in your heart, in your sphere of influence, that he wants you to reach for Jesus Christ? Are you doing that? Have you told them about him? One of my nearby neighbors does not want to hear anything about the name God. In fact, he told me, he says, don't ever come to my house with the Bible. Don't ever knock on my door. But having one of my door hangers, I went ahead and did it anyway. <laughs> you know, and invited him to the End Times Conference. I'm sure it ended up in his fireplace. But you know, uh, the Lord put it on my heart. He said, go tell him. Your job's to tell. My job is what? To convict. So we just went and told him. And that's what we did with the other hundred door knockers. Go tell. So is there anyone that you need to tell that you know? Because what God holds us accountable. 
It gives me no undue pleasure, Brother Jerry, to see you doing the only reason I taught at Crystal College is to help people gain a passion to reach other people for Jesus Christ. If you could add me up and pour me in a bottle, that would be the one thing that motivates me in life is to tell people about Christ and to live Him before other people. And then leave the rest to Him and He, he always takes care of it. Or we wouldn't be here today. We, we, we'd be somewhere else. So we learned that James is the second book. Now there's another person who's very near to Jesus and that is Peter. Let's look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 7. And I will give you a copy of all these scriptures so I'll let you study them yourselves. Peter says in writing, okay, once again to the Jewish people, he says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober-minded and watch for yourselves under prayer. Wow, Peter. I mean, you're the guy that stuck your foot, he stuck his foot in his mouth quite often and everything else. He's the one that preached the sermon of Pentecost. So you know, he's got a lot of great credibility, but he says, what, the end of all things is what is at hand right now. So we look at James, we look at Peter, they both really believe well, that Jesus could come right then. But there's been 2,000 years go by. And we're going to try and understand, and you'll find another word a little bit later on in this message that will help you identify what they're talking about with the word age and ends and different things like that. Let's look in Hebrews, which, uh, let's see, uh, who wrote Hebrews, Jared? <laughs> <laughs> he knows. <laughs> who, knows? <laughs> he knows. who knows? Well, uh, Jared's father, who's a good friend of mine, has written a wonderful piece of work on the, the book of Hebrews. So if you'll look with me there very quickly in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 through 25, then we'll pop over to verse 37. He says, And let us consider one another to provoke one another what to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some people are, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see what the day approaching. What day is he talking about? The day of the revelation of Jesus Christ will rule and reign on the earth. So we find that Luke, you know, once again, you know, is telling us. <laughs> You know, something very important. Now, let's jump down to verse 37. He says, For yet a little while, and he that is coming will come, and he will, he will not tarry. Tarry is something you know, as we think about in our lifetime in chronology and time and minutes and hours. But tarry is not really time and minutes to God. Tarry is epical or age-centered. Let's look in 1 John 2, 18. Here's someone else. You know, it's very close to Jesus. And you know, it's, I think it's amazing, you know, that when the James and Peter were first before the Sanhedrin, what did they think of them? They said that they perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men, but the magic thing about the great thing about them, they had been of Jesus. So the more time we spend with Him, what, the more you're going to look like Him. So let's look in 1 John 2 in chapter 18. And John says, little children, it's the last time. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, but which will know what it's the last time. If you look again over here in verse 28 of chapter 2, he says, and now, little children, and he uses a special word, little tekinah, abide in him, that when he comes and when he appears, We'll have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If we know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is what born of him. Wow. That tells us what there are going to be many antichrists. Now, if you've lived as long as I have for 63 years, you know that there are all kinds of people who have been labeled the antichrist. I can remember the first incident I had. They said, told us that Henry Kissinger was an antichrist and there was a magical numerical formula that added up to 666. Recently, you know, I just discovered that Barack Obama is, you know, the antichrist. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he may have some attributes <laughs> that favor that kind of thing. But uh, I don't want to be political up here. And uh, there have been other people, you know, throughout through Hitler, there was a magical numerical formula for him, all the way Stalin, 
But you know, you'll know him when he comes. Because when he rises, I believe he'll come out of the Middle East and he'll have a false prophet. And that false prophet, I'm beginning to believe stronger and stronger, Jerry, that he'll have a strong Muslim tie as well as a some kind of tie to Catholicism or to uh, Christian, uh, generalized Christianity as we see. Because many people, when you say Christian, they think Catholic, but that's not necessarily true. But he'll have some kind of alignment in that direction. In fact, maybe Jared will be able to elaborate more on this our question and answer time. The Muslim people are looking for somebody else to come too. They're looking for the Mahdi to come. You know, as a, another embodiment. And uh, I believe that person, the Mahdi, I believe he probably more than likely is the Antichrist. You know, I can't say that with 100% assurance, but I say the events and the person and the signs of Scripture tend to point that way to me because of his recognition. Uh, John also tells us something very important here. He says that when he appears, we can have confidence before him. What gives you confidence to come before God? Well, if we have been wrong and we have not been obeying God what our confidence what is often shaken but we can have confidence before God because what Jesus has not only made the way open for us but we can have confidence experientially by our daily obedience to him is there anything in your life tonight that would stop you from having confidence before him if he was to come right now what in your life needs to stop what needs to start what do you need to be doing well, then you must be doing that if you're going to stand before him and you're going to have confidence. That confidence comes from when he rewards us. And you may remember, I know maybe Jared and Joel remember from my class, I told them, what does God reward you for? You'll remember from 1 Corinthians, it is for what gold, silver, and precious stones. Gold always speaks of divinity or the deity of Christ. I believe that is Christ in you. Silver always speaks of redemption or something that's being redeemed. I believe that is evangelistic work. And precious stones is always connected with prayer. And when we pray, that does God's answered prayer. It is not a perfunctory thing that we do because we are Christians. We do it as we live the Christian life. Prayer becomes our what an example or a exact, a exact exit or a way of us describing our relationship with God. So those are the things we're rewarded with. And I can go into more of that. So we learned that from the doctrine of Scripture. Oh yes, there's one, a couple others I'd like to look at very quickly with you. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. This is John again. And he's getting ready to write from the book. John says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants, or his deacons, things which must shortly come to pass, and he said and signified it by his angel to his what? His servant John. Things what must shortly come to pass. In a very narrow margin of time. And now lastly, let's look in Titus very quickly. And we'll see what Peter, I mean what Paul has to say. He's writing to Titus. And Titus is what? About to ordain bishops and deacons on the island of Crete. A bunch of new church plants have gone on. He says, For the grace of God, 2.11, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul is telling what Titus, once again, is something to look forward to. Keep the idea of eminence that Jesus could come at any moment. It's just not simply an idea, but it is a reality. Have you ever met anyone who, one, who suddenly you were in their presence, then the next thing you knew they had passed on? That's happened to me at least half a dozen times. And sadly to say, I can think of two of those people that had turned away and said, well, one day I'll get things together. You know, and one day it was too late. I can think of the other four people, and I'm think, thinking I'd see their faces right now, said, yes, if he was to come, I would be ready tonight. So is that the state of your life? That is what the doctrine of eminence will do to us because it underlines one thing, we are accountable to God. We want to have a good report with him. 
know that he'll be pleased with our work, that we'll be rewarded, and that's a great motivation to please him. What, what we'll believe in the doctrine of the he could come. Does God want us to know when his son is coming? My answer is absolutely unequivocally yes. <coughs> Look with me in 2 Timothy very quickly. We want to try and save our 30 minute time, but I want to give you a gigantic, what I call it, doctrinal overview of eminence. Let's look in 2 Timothy 3. The Apostle Paul tells his son, his, he calls him his dearly beloved son, 2 Timothy. He says, Timothy, know this, in the last days what perilous times will come. For men will be what lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, unthankful, unholy, disobedience to parents, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce or brutal, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady or headstrong people, or high-minded or conceited people, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it, from such turn away. Whew, well, is that strong? Do you see that taking place anywhere? <laughs> Man, if that is, I thought that was a description when I first started studying the scriptures in 1972. Now I'm looking at 2012, almost 43 years later. That's a bigger description, more descriptive than ever in the age in which we live in. Do people love their own selves today? <laughs> Click. Let me take a <laughs> selfie. <laughs> now there's nothing inherently evil in a selfie, but now people get consumed with them in this selfie. And it's all about, you know, everything. It's all about me. And people are literally that consumed with themselves. Are people covetous? Oh, my goodness, yeah. Everybody wants what you have. There are people boastful, proud, blasphemers? Yes. There are people, you know, that have no problem taking God's name in vain, insulting the deity Christ, anything. It's, it's no problem whatsoever. One day, they're going to have a big problem because it's going to cease. Disobedient to parents? Yeah. Boy, we an epidemic of that today. Unthankful, unholy? Yeah, you get the generation that says, yeah, I did it all on my own. It was me, it was myself, and it was I. I don't need God. I don't need anyone. I can do it myself. I call them the uh, Tony Robbins syndrome. You know, you know who Tony Robbins is, certainly. You know, he writes those books, you know. He has this big, you know, he has false implant teeth. You know, and so he has this huge smile. So you can do it yourself. <laughs> you can be strong like me. You know, you can, and he just this cheesy smile. I thought, man, you know, turn the lights down with this guy or something. And he's about to blind me with those teeth. And goes, but if you're right, you'll get my book. And all his book is, is is a bunch of hodgepodge about you can do it. It's all about self. People without natural affection all over the place today. Natural affection is not only what homosexual behavior. I believe you don't see a lot of natural affection in homes today. People don't love their children like they need to. Children don't love their parents like they're supposed to. They don't respect them. That's without natural affection. People will be truce breakers. Do you know that in the history of our relationship with the country of Russia, I looked all this up, Russia has never kept one treaty with the United States. Not one. Guess how many treaties Iran has kept with the United States? Are people truce breakers today? Absolutely. Are people bald faced like? Yeah. You know, if you believe what I thought, I want to go there today. If you believe what you've heard in the news recently about nuclear freeze over there, shame on you. <laughs> Not true at all. But people be brutal despisers of those that are good. You know, boy, traitors. How much loves or pleasure more than lovers of God? Having a form of godliness but not in the power of it? What happens to me? The power of God is what, not about me controlling God, but it's about God controlling me and changing me from the inside out. So that's just a picture of how I can know. We've already looked at 1 Thessalonians 4. And our last scripture, let's look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then we're going to go back to Romans 13. And look at, you know, can we know 
And then my answer is absolutely we can know. But can we know the actual day or hour? No. But we know we can look in God's Word and we can see. A Thessalonians were a group of people that Paul had recently you know, reached after he came from Philippi and been shamefully treated. And so he was reaching out then. They were under intense persecution at this time. And they are being victimized by people who are saying that the day of the Lord is already here. You have missed the rapture of the church. So we look at 2 Thessalonians 2 and it says, Now we beseech you, brothers, by the coming of our Lord Jesus, by gathering together to him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us as the day of the Lord is what present. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come except there come a fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not, when I yet was with you, I told you these things, and now you know what restrains, that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity already is at work. Only he who hinders will continue to hinder until he is taken out of the way. And then will that wicked person be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth, destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all the seemless of unrighteousness in people that are perishing, because they receive not the love of the truth that they may be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be judged who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. That's strong meat right there. And so Paul is telling the Thessalonians, he said, you know what, this has not already happened. He said, what, because what the son of perdition is basically, it's not been revealed. There is no temple been rebuilt. I believe that as sure as I am standing here tonight, that there will be a temple that will be rebuilt. I've stood there many a number of times here in Jerusalem. I, I know Jared and Joel have. And I said, okay, Lord, move over, mosque. <laughs> Maybe it'll be parallel to each other. I don't know, but you know, I think there's room. So we'll see what happens. But you know, when you start seeing that happen, boy, you got to know this there. I was so blessed on my last two trips to Israel when we went to got to visit the shop where they are actually preparing uh, the garments and they showed us for the high priest to wear gold, vestments, everything that a person would need for the Levitical sacrificial system already prepared, ready to go. And so we know it must be near. But the son of perdition, what well, he needs to be revealed first. If he has been had been revealed, you know that you missed the rapture. <laughs> yeah, you're not one of them. But Paul says the mystery of iniquity is already at work. And so and Satan is, he is continually, I believe, not only will he deceive greatly during the tribulation period, he is deceiving right now. Can Satan work miracles? The answer is yes, he can. Can he deceive beyond it just ordinary deceiving me? Yes, he can absolutely deceive a person to where they don't believe the truth any longer. Have you ever met a person who's a reprobate? can't receive the truth, doesn't know the truth anymore. Yeah, I, did, I have. They you know, have gone past a day or a point in their life where they can no longer, they have turned God off and turned God off where they can no longer discern what is good and evil. Because that is what a reprobate person is. A reprobate person who is, is a person who cannot tell good from evil anymore, but everything is amoral to them. Whatever feels good, we will do it. There are no consequences for what we do. So is Jesus coming back? Yes. The doctrine of eminence, I believe, as we have read, has been taught in Scripture all the way from James to the author of Hebrews to John, probably the last book in the New Testament written, First John, First and Second, Third John. We know that Jesus is coming back. We know what it's going to look like. Now, the third question you want to ask, are you ready? So let's look in Romans chapter 13 and find out if you're ready. This is in verse 11. Paul says, And that, knowing the time, that it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. 
Let us therefore cast off the work of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in the reveling and drunkenness, not in immorality and licentiousness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Wow. That's good. He said, and that knowing the time. And he uses, that's why I wanted to talk to you about earlier. He uses a very specialized word there. He said, he does not use the word chronos, which we get the word chronology from, or the word kairos. He uses the word kairos, not our, he uses chronos because he's talking about epical age. He is not talking about a kairos, it's in hours and minutes. He said, but knowing the age that we're in right now, now is our salvation nearer than we believe. Earlier this week, what? You're just that, about that much closer. So time is moving on. And when God says the end of this age comes, it's going to come. So what should our response be? Well, Paul includes himself in the list. He said, what? The night's as far spent. He said, let us walk honestly is in the day. Said not in reveling and drunkenness, not in immorality and wantonness, not in strife and envy. If I were to look at many churches today, what three groups of sins would I see? I would see these right here. They are present. So he said the answer to that what is not only to stop doing, but to start doing something. And what do we start doing? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make provision for the flesh. How do you put the Lord Jesus Christ on? Very simply, you get up every day and you say, Lord Jesus, this is not my life. This is your life. What do you want to, where do you want to go today? What do you want to say? And what would you like to do? That is what putting him on is in an experiential way. You submit yourself to him and then let him what? Direct you to every step of the day through the words you say, through the actions you take, and you will be pleasing for him. And, what, and you'll be prepared for when you stand before Him, you'll stand before Him with confidence. Because God does not reward on how big your ministry is. He rewards on what how faithful your ministry is. So are you being faithful today? Are you persuaded by the doctrine of eminence tonight in this end times prophecy conference? Let me ask you to pray with me tonight. And I want you to... Say something to the Lord in your own words. Lord, help me to understand the doctrine of eminence. Help eminence and that doctrine, that teaching from your word to so affect my life that I live every day with the anticipation that you are coming and I'm accountable to you. And Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence this very evening. We need your help in this church. Lord, there are people dying and going to hell all around us. We need to gain your passion, passion, Lord Jesus, for lost people. And we know that as we are filled with your spirit, Lord Jesus, that is a reality. Because you are still there and you are available. You came to give your life a ransom for many. And we believe that many are still out there right now. Now, if you would pray with me tonight. You can use your own words. Lord Jesus, I'm not ready for you to come. My life is not what it needs to be. And you may need to say to him tonight, Lord, this is what I need to do. Lord, I'm not being faithful. My attitudes aren't right. My actions aren't right. But I want to get them right. I want to stop. And I want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision anymore because I want to live in the fear and the expectancy of your imminent return for me my accountability to you and to have confidence before you and Lord Jesus I want to say that I love you thank you that you are faithful to me and I want to be faithful to you and all that I say and do and all that you've put in my sphere of influence and it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me share with you about eminence. Thank you, Dr. Joel. We appreciate that very much. And uh, it's a good reminder that uh, every day is a blessing because, uh, I mean, we could be called home. 
Christ could return as soon as possible. And we just need to be ready and expectant the imminence of the return of Christ. Let's go ahead and worship together in two songs, and then we'll have a time. It's an intermission time where you can get some refreshments and talk to other people about questions you have. We'll come back for two sessions from Jared Allen. All right, let's go ahead and worship. Thank you, Brother Joe. We appreciate you being here. Everybody doing good today? Would you stand and sing for me? I'm going to sing a couple of songs. You know, simple like this. Over the mountains and the sea. Your river loves with love to me And I will open up my heart I'm meant to hear the set free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will deal with my hands For I will always see But when your love came down I can see of your love forever I can see of your love I see things all the time, I read things all the time, and it's just amazing, even, I would love to get him prick your brain, but it's amazing, even with the Roman Orthodox Church and how that's involved and all that stuff. But you know what, when, when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, when the music fades and it's all said and done, we're all gonna come back to the heart of worship. And that's what we're gonna sing right now. We're going to close our eyes as Matt Redmond soon. If you know this song, it's about the heart of worship. It's about worshiping Christ and being ready for what he does come. And rise to meet him in the air as he parts that sky. And we see with his hands open wide and we just rise, rise. It's amazing. When the music fades, all is slipped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart I bring you more than a song 
song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made. But it's all about you. It's all about you. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Lord, we can pour all I have is yours, every single breath.